This is the Expanding Boundaries Podcast. Do you feel trapped? Stuck in a world of mediocrity, constrained by bad habits, limiting beliefs, and feeling unfulfilled? Do you feel that deep down you know you were destined for much more? In Expanding Boundaries, you'll discover how you can break free and step into your real life, a life without limits. And now, here's your host, Michael McLeish. Hello again, and welcome back to the Expanding Boundaries podcast. Before I begin today's show, I do have a small ask for you. As you know, I'm just getting started with the podcast here, this being, I think, the fifth episode so far. And I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from my listeners and get some feedback from you, the good, the bad, the ugly. If there's some other topics or some other things you want to delve into on the show, please just take a moment. Find me on Facebook, find me on Instagram, shoot me a direct message, and I promise I'll respond right away, and I will appreciate the feedback. And you can find me there at Michael McLeish Official on either of those platforms. So with that said, I'd like to dive right into the show here. And as you may already know, I love to travel. The theme of this show does have some travel and adventure undertones. And I like to travel around the United States, explore new places I've been, and I do like to go travel abroad, and it's been pretty limited so far. However, today's guest is going to help us uh, expand those boundaries a little bit. Coming to us from the opposite side of the globe as we speak, I think you're going to get a ton of value from her perspective today. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction here. Today's Can guest. I interject there, Mike? Yes, please. The please. So, um, guys, I just <laughs> want to say, get ready for an Aussie accent as you're listening to this. But I'm also technically coming to you from the future, Mike, as well. So I'm a day ahead of you. So, uh, oh, so don't don't ask your listeners to to ask me for the Tats Lotto numbers or anything. I don't have those. But I can tell you that life is pretty good tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. All right. So the podcast from the future. Here we go. Alicia here is a passionate and driven global real estate investor. She is based out of Australia and, believe it or not, doing real estate deals here in the United States. She co-owns multiple businesses, including Global Citizens Holdings, Incorporated, Land Scouts, and Supercharged Offers. And within her day-to-day, she focuses on business leadership, land investing, providing efficient marketing solutions in the direct mail and digital space, as well as world-class data solutions. To round it off, she's an experienced executive leadership coach and business management specialist. And wow, that's that's a lot to say, isn't it? So <laughs> welcome to the show, Alicia, Alicia Thanks, Jarrett. Mike. Thank you for being here. Absolute is- pleasure. It is actually funny when I hear that intro being read out because I just see myself as an everyday person like you and me, right? It, I'm just doing what I'm doing on a daily basis. So. <laughs> Yeah. There's nothing strange about it. Uh, that's right. You know, I had a just yesterday, we were in a discussion online with somebody. We were talking about jujitsu. And uh, he said, you know, Mike, a black belt is just a white belt that didn't stop training. It just I kept building on top of that every single day. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. You just start where you are and just, just keep, keep your on feet going. going. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. So, I don't know a whole lot about Australian geography, but can you tell us specifically where you are located? Yeah, there? yeah. So I am down south in the beautiful city of, as we say here, Melbourne, but it's, uh, as people know, Melbourne. And Melbourne is, is wonderful. It's a city of 5 million people and it's very multicultural. We love our music, our arts, our uh, food, wine, culture. It's like the Europe of Australia, Mike. So for anybody visiting, yes, Sydney's wonderful. It's great, but Sydney and Melbourne have this rivalry about which is better. Personally, I mean, Melbourne has actually won the most livable city in the world, I think, seven times now. So we are we're in a pretty good spot here. <laughs> Can't complain. All right. <laughs> well, that sounds great. I would love to get down there and visit one of these days. When Come I was a that. kid. When I was a kid, my mom was going to take us there at one point, and it just it didn't pan out. And uh, I've always had that in my bucket list for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll dive in here. I've got a little bit of an icebreaker question. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch this up a little bit from the way I've asked it in the past. But you did mention in your in the bio that you sent me that you do love to travel, and I think we've talked about that a little bit in the past. Yeah. What's one place in the world that you must 
visit in your lifetime? Oh, goodness. How long have we got, Mike? So let me start by saying I, I have, in my travels, I have filled a number of passports. I've done a lot of travel in my 47 years on this planet. I've done extensive travel throughout Europe and Asia and the US and um, into the United Kingdom and all around. And I've spent countless days on airplanes. But I think the the one place, it's going to be an odd one, but I've got a bucket list of things that I want to do in life. And there's one place in the Cook Islands called um, Achutaki. And there is a specific lagoon in Achutaki that is absolutely spectacular. And I love snorkeling and things like that. So that is on my bucket list to do before I leave this uh, this, this world. <laughs> but certainly there's also places I'd go back to, Mike. Like I absolutely love, love, love Italy and Croatia. They're, I've been to them many times and they're up there in my, my favorite places in the world. And I also love skiing. So anywhere that involves um getting on a pair of skis and going down a mountain. Now, here's the thing. I've done skiing in Canada and all across Europe, but I have not done the US yet. So maybe next time Mm. I'll be coming to visit you and going to, say, Park City or somewhere like that. (laughs) Yeah. Utah and Colorado have some amazing skiing for sure. Yeah. All right. Wow. those The Cook Islands one is right up my alley. That has been a dream as mine as well in that area, like Micronesia, Yeah. all that. Uh, There's some amazing... If you like to dive, uh, that's the place. So, yep, absolutely. That is amazing. All right. So, well, you said some bucket list things. So, in that one place you mentioned, you know, going into the lagoon, doing some some diving, snorkeling like that. Is there anything else that you would have to do there, as far as bucket list things there? Uh, in terms of Achitaki, no, I'd probably just be getting on a boat and cruising around the islands and just finding little pockets. I mean, that's a part of the world that is still relatively untouched. It's it's quite touristy, mm-hmm. but there's still a lot of areas that you could just cruise up to an atoll and jump off the boat and start snorkeling or diving in the middle of nowhere. And it's just a beautiful part of the world. So if it was me, I'd probably spend a week or two there just cruising around on a boat and getting up in the morning and having my morning cup of tea. I'm a tea drinker, not a coffee drinker. And literally diving off the side of the boat into the water, That that would be my dream for a couple of weeks. And I've done that in Croatia. I've hired a yacht for a couple of weeks in Croatia and just pulled up the yacht to wherever we want and jumped off, literally in the middle of the ocean, just jumped off the side and started checking out the world. It's a pretty cool way to live. <laughs> oh my goodness. Maybe we should just have the whole podcast on that because I'm, I'm yeah. drooling right now. Can you now. imagine doing a podcast <laughs> on a boat? I can. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> all right. So with all your traveling experience that you've had, you know, outside of the clothing and toiletries and the necessary things you would bring for that trip, What's one thing that you never leave home without when you're traveling? Oh, definitely a passport. That goes without saying. But I'd say the one thing I never leave home without, and, and it's actually a gift that got bought for me a couple of years ago. And it's funny because you're you're wearing something pretty cool at the moment. It's my noise canceling headphones, believe it or not. I didn't really think much of them when they first came out. I was like, surely that's not going to work. Like, you know, when you're on airplanes, you can hear everything. But until somebody bought me a good pair of, of noise cancelling and they're, they're Sennheiser there, they're really great. And I, even when I'm traveling interstate here and if it's a 45-minute flight to go and see my family, I'll still take my headset. And even if I don't listen to anything, I just pop them on and get some silence because, yeah. you know, you and I, Mike, we have busy lives and I'm on calls for about seven hours a day with, with customers and, uh, and doing different things with my teams sometimes it's nice to just put those headphones on and just get some quiet time. Totally get that. There's not <laughs> enough. But you always have to make some space for some quietness in your mind there. And that's, that's a good opportunity. Yeah, I love that. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive into some of the good stuff I want to get with you here today. And again, having read off that abbreviated form of your bio, I mean, super impressive. And and let's face it, I mean, to some of our listeners, I think myself included, it's a little intimidating, right? No. And I know a lot of people here, <laughs> you know, they don't even have a business or maybe they've, they're just getting started. So, you know, were you always in the world of business as an owner or consultant or how no, did that no, uh, evolve for you? No, Mike. Yeah, I really wasn't. So let me kind of delve in a little bit to my story, if that's okay. But before I do, yeah. I just want to say one thing um, to a point you've just made. There was a point in time that I also didn't have a business. There was a point in time that I also was starting something. And I think it's just, you know, I, I don't want people to listen to that that intro and feel intimidated at all because as you've known me for a while, I'm 
I'm just an easygoing, nice person, right? I'm just normal. But the, I think it really comes from those points in our life where we have those sliding door moments that we make decisions to either do something or not do something. And then that determines our outcomes, right? So, you know, I'm just like everybody else, but there's certain points in time that I made a decision to start something and I didn't even know where it would go. So, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to share my story with you, Mike, if you like, and, and talk a little bit more about how I got to where I am. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. where did it, where did it all begin? What was, um, you know, briefly, yeah. like, what was growing up like? And then how did you transition into the world of business? Yeah. Growing up was very different to what I, I am living my life as now. And I guess, you know, there was a, a number of sliding door moments throughout my life, but I actually grew up in the country. I'm a country girl. I was born in, in interstate in uh, Adelaide, South Australia, in the country, grew up um, in a very, very small country town uh, that's in, in rural uh, South Australia. I went to a primary school that there was only like 60 kids in the whole school. So you had mixed mixed classrooms because, you know, there wasn't enough kids to come sometimes fill a class. <laughs> and so I grew up in, in what I would call absolute bliss because we had horses, we had cows, we rode motorbikes, we went bushwalking. We did all those things. And I know you love that kind of stuff with your kids as well. And I think growing up, that was an absolute gift that my parents gave me because my love of the great outdoors and everything still kind of runs in my blood. However, there comes a point in time that uh, you reach those teenage years and you start to see that the world is a bit bigger than your own backyard. <laughs> and you start to have to make decisions about, you know, what do I want to do when I grow up? And, and for me, when you're a 14, 15-year-old teenager, what you want to do when you grow up really only extends for the next few years about deciding what you want to study or, or where you want to go. And I always knew that there was something bigger out there for me. I was never going to be one of these people that settled down and married a local country kid and and uh, and had babies. That that wasn't my my thing. So I went and, and went into university and I had, again, my first sliding door moment was I got into a legal college in Adelaide in South Australia and I got into a university to study psychology and sociology in a university in Victoria. And I went, you know what? Adelaide is the easy option because that's where all my family is located. I'm going to choose Melbourne and where I don't know anyone. It was actually another town before uh, I moved to Melbourne, but I'm going to choose the more challenging option. And in retrospect, that was the right option because a, a friend of mine I moved interstate with and, and we started studying together. But here's the thing. There's failures in my story as well, Mike. I lasted. I was 17 years old. I left my family. I moved into state and was going to a university in a town that I, was all new to me. And I lasted nine months. And the reason why I lasted nine months is I don't think I knew what I wanted to do yet. And I spent more time at the beach and at the pub than what I did at school. Because when you move out of home at that age, life's all about exploring, right? So I think I made one of the best decisions in my life at that point. I left university and I moved um, into the, the city of Melbourne where I didn't know anyone and I started working. And uh, that was the pivotal moment for me because then I got into a number of different careers. Uh, I started in retail and in insurance, then went into human resources, which then became my career. I was in human resources and uh, industrial relations for more than 15 years and I loved that. And that started getting me into the corporate world. So then in my mid-20s, I went back and finished my studies, um, but then also ended up with a graduate diploma because at that stage, I was a little bit more mature, Mike. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Through the school of hard life, knocks, life for happened, sure. Right. right. Yeah. So then um, I, I got into the corporate environment and I had a really fantastic career across a number of different industries over those 15 to 17 years, whatever it might have been. But then I got to sort of my mid, early to mid 30s and thought, mm, all right, by that stage, I was working in executive roles. I'd become uh, an executive uh, HR person globally, working in global businesses. I, I was having a great career. From the outside looking in, you'd probably go, wow, you know, that, that person's kind of made it. But I've got to say, Mike, on the inside, I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't overly loving what I was doing and the stress of it all was starting to get to me as well. And I thought, right, well, what, what's next? So I made the decision to go and uh, start my own business. And let me tell you though, that decision, Mike, sliding door moments, that decision took two years. And here's why. If you are in what I call a J-O-B, a job, which in my acronym, Mike, that stands for just over broke because everybody who I know is in a job 
they basically spend within their means of what they're making. They don't really have a plan unless they've got other things that that are in mind. And it's not until you get that more entrepreneurial mindset that you start to really think about these things. So it took me two years to walk away from that paycheck because every month there was a certain amount of money coming in and that felt pretty safe and pretty good. And yet still wasn't fulfilling, which just goes to show that, you know, money doesn't often equal happiness. So after two years of going, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I made the decision, I left. I actually took three months off and went and traveled in Europe for three months and really just thought about what my future looked like, my my business ideas, et cetera, came back and started a training and consulting business, really focused in in on my, my human resources skills and my consulting skills. And that went really, really well. So for more than a decade, I was working in organizations doing training, uh, team effectiveness, leadership coaching, leadership training programs really helping organizations to help their people be more effective. And I loved it. But again, get to that point after about a decade and go, this isn't really filling my cup anymore. What's next? And my sliding door moment then, Mike, was because I went to a seminar here in Melbourne. I love going to seminars and seeing people speak because I was a speaker for a living. I did keynotes and things as well. So for me, going and seeing great people speak lights me up and I I get good ideas from it as well. I went along to this uh, this event here in Melbourne and um, uh, Richard Branson and Tony Robbins were actually two of the head note speakers. And I've, I've followed Tony Robbins for many years and I'd done his programs and things as well. And and it really, um, at that, that particular uh, conference, there was a speaker there whose name I forget now and I should remember it, uh, but they came and spoke about the US and real estate investing in the US. And I was like, I've always loved real estate because I've got a few investment properties here in Australia. And you know that whole concept of, this was just after the market crash, by the way, that whole concept of helping people where the banks are no longer going to help and allowing people in their communities to get back into their homes and things like that, that really inspired me. So I went to the back of the room, as most people do, and I signed up for a program. And I came home and I said to my partner, Matt, I was like, just so you know, we're going to a course on how to do uh, real estate in the US. And he's like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I said, yeah, it sounded really great. We're going to go along and do this three-day course and learn all about it. And uh, him being the the skeptic that he is, a healthy skeptic, he said, all right, I'll go along with you. But if we get to day one and by lunchtime, I'm not inspired and I think this is a whole lot of BS, I'm out of there. It's like, cool, no problem. Sounds like a good agreement. So we went along to this course and this is a couple of weeks later and um, and we were there and by lunchtime, I remember I turned to him and I was like, what do you think? And he's, he just, he was like, okay, wow, there's so much more to this than what we realized and this could really be a good thing. And this comes back to travel again because all along, Mike, even when I was doing my consulting business, now the one thing that entrepreneurs need to always think about is where our time equals our money. And if we're always exchanging our time for money, and that time means that we have to be present, then you can only expand so far. So with my training and consulting business, I was only able to do so much because people were buying me. They wanted me to go in and run training and consulting and do all these things. But I still wanted to do more travel. So it was like, okay, well, what business can I implement that would allow me to be wherever in the world I want to be? And as long as I've got a phone and a laptop, I can work. And real estate became the answer. So here we are, um, nearly six and a half, seven years later. Uh, So we started off doing houses. We did some fix and flips. Now, I don't want this to become a real estate conversation because it's not. But what I do want it to become is a strategy conversation because we had a strategy in place to do houses. We did quite a few and absolutely loved it. But then we deviated outside of our strategy and all of a sudden that didn't work anymore. And that's when we got into vacant land. So again, point in time, sliding door moment. Do we stick with houses even though it wasn't working or do we pivot to a different asset class and try something different? And now we've got Land Scouts, which is our land business. And as you know, we also have a real estate marketing business that we help other real estate investors build out their branding, their marketing and everything as well. So, you know, things are going great, Mike. It's, uh, I won't <laughs> lie and say it's, it's easy because it's not. There's lots of long hours. There's lots of working things out as you go, but that's part of the journey. That is a great story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Country girl to, see, uh, to global yeah. entrepreneur. <laughs> 
I mean, could you, as the country girl, you know, saying, I'm going to go to the big city and go to school, could you imagine your life where you're sitting right now? No, not at all. I, I would never have thought that this is what I would be doing. I, I had in mind that I wanted to stick with being a, a psychologist or a counselor or something like that because I've always had an inherent thing about helping people. It's just part of my DNA, right? I'm, I'm a service first, helpful first type of person and that, that's what I love doing. But did I think I'd be doing this? Heck no! <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. So what what was it, I guess a few things that I wanted to hit, again, not making this a real estate podcast, but when you went to that and they said, hey, you can do real estate deals in the United States, why not do that in your own backyard using the yeah. same model or is, or is that not possible? Great question. Great question. Yeah, it's actually not possible. And it's not possible for a number of reasons. One, access to data and information. So in Australia, our privacy laws are pretty locked down tight. So in the US, as you and I know, Mike, when we do deals, I can go and find out everything about you, your property, your loans, your back taxes, your liens, where you live. I can find out anything and everything and contact you direct and talk about your property like I know exactly what I'm talking about. In Australia, right. that's almost non-existent. You really can't do that. Mm. And secondary here is the uh, market entry point. So I've done real estate in Australia and... Um, I've had a number of rental properties that I've bought and sold over the years. We've renovated a house here. We've done a few things, but the cost is exorbitant. It's almost like the whole of Australia. It's pretty much like San Francisco. So the average house here in Melbourne, I'm talking the average, I'm not talking the rich areas in Melbourne. Average house is just on a million or just under. And if you want to live in the really nice areas, you're talking like three to four million dollars just for a nice house. So wow. it's pretty crazy and it's a market that, you know, th that's not for the whole of Australia, by the way. That's the city that, that we live in here. It's one of the most expensive cities in the world, um, but it's beautiful. But, you know, it doesn't make our strategy of, of what we want to do and the cost of contractors, the cost of goods and things like that if you want to do houses, it's pretty expensive. So mm. as a, if you want to do it on volume, you've got to have millions of dollars behind you. Wow. So you had a few things going for you. And one, you had your perspective of what it's already like in Australia, right? Yeah. And then looking at the the resources, the data that's available here, the price point, the profitability, the risk, it sounds like it was a no-brainer. But what's really interesting is you had that perspective of where you were. There's a lot of people in our marketplace now that just go, oh, it's so hard it's so hard to do a deal it's here. It's really not. There's let no me, let deals. me say one thing here, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anyone listening is that currently in the US and they're thinking about real estate in the US, let me give you one little word of wisdom here. You don't realize how lucky you are. You can still buy houses and land in the US off market for, you know, 50% of retail value or less. It, it's crazy. And uh, in the rest of the world, and we, we also researched other markets, there is nothing compared to what you can do in the US. So perspective is everything. Yeah, that's that's exactly my point is look at what your alternatives are and then you can realize how fortunate you might be yep. in your own circumstances. So Correct. That is awesome. Okay, so what kind of fears did you have? Like, you went to Matt and said, hey, I want to go to this course. I want to learn how to do this. And, you know, if it was me, I'd have all these like fears, these doubts, like, come on, that's on the other side of the world. That's that's this couldn't possibly work. This might be a scam. This might yeah. not work. How did you how did you overcome those voices? Yeah, first of all, I didn't have the voices. Uh, I think this is an interesting thing. I guess that we were in a, a place for ourselves personally and professionally that we were really looking for something else. And I think when you're looking for something through the lens of what if, you know, what if this did work? What if we could do deals from anywhere in the world? What if, you know, what if, what if, what if? There's a whole bunch of things you can ask yourself around. And I think as soon as we start to ask ourselves, well, what if this didn't work? What if it failed? You end up looking for reasons why not. So part of the, the self-talk as being an entrepreneur and, and you know, this talks about expanding boundaries, right? This is the, the topic of, of your whole podcast, expanding boundaries. Sometimes those boundaries that we need to expand is our language, what we're telling ourselves, what we believe to be true, the evidence that we're searching for that tells us it is or isn't true, all of that type of stuff. So when it came to us doing this, 
we we had a, a number of things working in our favor. We had time, we had resources, and we had the right attitude. And we just said, why don't we give this a go? We'll start with house number one and let's just go for it and see what happens. And that turned into house number two, house number three, and so on and so forth. So yeah, we, we didn't actually have that language. But in saying that, I've actually got, uh, you can't see it above me, but where I'm sitting here with my computer, I've got some some big post-it notes. They're like really big ones uh, up in front of me because I often have those moments in, in myself where particularly when I'm pretty stressed or there's stuff going on, that my self-doubt does creep in. It's normal. As an entrepreneur, that, that doubt of, oh, is this the right thing or am I doing the right stuff? Am I good enough for this? Am I knowledgeable enough? Am I heading in the right direction? That self-doubt does creep in every now and then, and that's the reality. So I've actually gotten some some post-it notes up here, and I'll read them out to you. The first one is, I believe in me, because nobody else is going to believe in you until you believe in you. And you can't keep looking externally for that validation. You've got to go, you know what? I've got to back myself, and I've got to believe that I can do this, and I have everything I need within me to be able to do this, whatever this is. So my first post-it note is, I believe in me, and I repeat that to myself quite a few times a day. And the second one is, where focus goes, energy flows. I'll say that again, Mike, where focus goes, energy flows. Something that Tony Robbins actually said many, many years ago, and, and it just sat with me because I was like, whatever we focus on, we get. So if I'm always focused on a state of lacking, where everything is negative or um, scarcity type stuff, guess what? That's going to show up. But if I'm focused on abundance and can do and my energies on that, guess what? That shows up as well. Those are both very powerful. <laughs> and I, I can reflect on my own life. And there's been many cases where I was like, I want to do this thing. And I kept focused on it. And over the course of, I mean, it wasn't immediate. But over the course of two, three, four years, I found myself living in the place that I said I wanted to live in five years yeah. before. Yeah, that's right. And sometimes it happens almost by osmosis. We don't realize that when we wake up one day and go, oh, that thing that I was thinking about, I'm, yeah. I'm it now. Yeah. <laughs> I remember so my, you know, I said to you earlier, I've done more than 50 podcasts. There's something about, I think for, for people in the US talking to an Aussie about what they're doing in the US seems, seems pretty appealing. But, you know, I remember doing my first one and I, I had that self-doubt around, can I possibly get on a podcast and talk about me? Like, is that really, are people really interested in that? And then I did my first one and went, well, that was that was easy. And I think it's because I, I forgot the fact that I'd been a public speaker for more than a decade. I, I do know what I'm doing and I'm really passionate about what I do. And I love the fact that I've created this life. Like, you know, don't don't forget the things that that, that support you and, and keep you where you are because it's really important to not lose sight of that stuff. So good. And, and do you have any more post-it notes? You said there's three, right? There is three. I'm not going to share the third one with you because it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a little more personal, that one. I'll leave that one where it is. <laughs> okay. Good. So I, I love that. I mean, I think that's really powerful. And, and for some reason, it was almost like we were taught that that's shameful activities, right? Yeah. They, even Saturday Night Live had the Stuart Smalley you know, like I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. And they kind of made fun of that that way of self talk. But the more successful people I've ever known, that's crucial. Is totally working on that self talk, working on the language, working on pumping themselves up. Because if they're not going to do it, nobody else is going to do it for them until correct. they have that energy up here, like you said. Yeah, correct, Mike. And and I think um, unfortunately, in in the the current day modern age that we live in, we're, we're born with that. And at some stage, it kind of gets beaten out of us a little bit because uh, we have a thing over here and it's, let me tell you, it's not as, it's definitely nowhere near like it in the US. But in Australia, we definitely have the tall poppy syndrome, which is like, if you've got this great idea, there'll be lots of people ready to chop that idea down and go, you can't do that. That won't work. Versus, you know, the US is a lot more, let's try that. Let's give that a go. So we love surrounding ourselves with, with our friends and networks in the US because they are a lot more entrepreneurial and, and bigger thinkers, which is great. But, you know, it, I think you're right in saying that. You, you would probably speak to any really successful person and they will tell you it's a constant struggle to keep that, that inner language the way that you want it because the external world will do a, everything in its power to change that internal language. 
That is powerful. So thank you for sharing that, uh, those notes. And I guess we'll start to to wind down here a little bit, but is there, I mean, in the, the vein of what we're just talking about, is, is there any other tools or things that you use on a daily basis to help you get into that mindset outside the post-it notes? Yeah, there, there's a few things. Um, I do, when, when I do create that space to have that time, I do like to go and meditate, which Sounds a bit zen, but uh, often it's a meditation that'll be a guided meditation on things like abundance, confidence, mindset. You know, it really kind of feeding feeding that bucket, if you like, and making sure, making sure that that bucket is is constantly full. The other thing is reading. Uh, I do love to to read and, uh, and constantly filling my my brain with stuff. But I've also, without doing a shameless plug, because I'm not getting paid for this whatsoever, but I've. Uh, Came across when I say paid, I'm not talking you. I'm talking this this app I'm about to talk about. It's called Mind Valley, and Mind Valley got released a couple of years ago, and it's grown in leaps and bounds. And it has the most amazing talks, uh, training programs, you know, meditations, different things on it that are, are pretty incredible. And so I've got a whole bunch of courses that I'm doing there, and I'm allocating myself 30 minutes a day. I think this is the other thing when it comes to expanding boundaries and being an, an entrepreneur, you need to keep a growth mindset around things. And a growth mindset is always, how can I do better? How can I learn from that? How can I learn more? How can I get a different perspective? And so allowing that 30 minutes a day, which I tend to do towards the end of the day, to just do some self-learning and keep my brain as sharp as I can, that stuff all helps, right? Absolutely. That might be one of the, the best three words an entrepreneur can have is how can I? Yeah. Um, and how can I do said, more learning? How can I yeah. grow? You know, how can I get different perspective? How can I write a different post-it note that might serve and support me today that, that I need to see in here? How can I make connections with people that will not only help them, but help me? You know, there's, if you ask yourself that question, even just three times a day, how can I? It makes the world a difference. So true. So I want to ask you one more question about your former self. So if, if you could go back to your country girl self, right? You're just about to go to the big city, go to school. If you could pull yourself aside, what would be the most meaningful advice you would have given yourself at that time? Oh, there's probably two. Uh, one's probably a funny one to start with, which is don't go and perm your hair again because perms in the 1980s and 1990s were never <laughs> a good idea even though I did. And uh, the second one would be, it's a little bit of a retrospective one, but I guess I would say to myself, if you ever think that you're going to make the decision to go and do something different, don't hesitate and just do it. Like there's a small part of me that wishes that I didn't wait two years to leave my job and go and start my own business. Because if I had have just believed in myself in that moment and jumped, I probably would be even further ahead than what I am now. That got me. <laughs> that is so, <laughs> so universally true. That is great advice. So what is, again, before we, we fully depart here, what is like one simple action item or tip that our listeners could implement to most expand their boundaries today? Yeah, one thing, and it's, it's a pretty simple one, but ask yourself what you need to hear. And I'm not saying hear from other people, but it kind of goes to the theme of what we've been talking about today, which is that self-affirmation language that we use because even our internal language, a bit of a, um, a, a thing to ask yourself on a daily basis is the way that I'm talking to myself, is that how I talk to my best friends or my family? Because often the way that we have our internal dialogue, we would never say to the people that we love, but we've got to start by loving ourselves first. And so if we really think about what's the language that I need to tell myself today, what are the words that I need to hear that are more affirming, more supporting, more guiding me in the right direction. Because believe it or not, you know, language is everything. And our language becomes our, our, our thoughts. Our thoughts become our values and our values become our behaviors and our behaviors lead to our outcomes. So what we tell ourselves, and, and I'll be free to admit, even up to two weeks ago, I was having a bit of an internal crisis myself. Some of the language I was using was like, poor where are we going with that? And it lasted for a few days and I had to snap myself out of it and go, come on, you know you know that this is not right. Let's change the language and, and work it up a bit here. Um, so yeah, I would talk about language. Okay. 
That is so powerful. I am going to have to listen to this this show two, three times <laughs> and absorb all this good stuff. So thank you very, very much. You're so welcome, Mike. Alicia, how can our guests find you or connect with you? Yeah, they can connect with me on Facebook. It's just uh, Alicia Jarrett, one word. They can connect with me on LinkedIn. They can connect with me on email. So Alicia, it's spelled A-L-I-C-I-A at superchargedoffers.com. Yeah, they can just just reach out via any of those means and, and get in touch. I'd love to speak with people about their businesses. And, you know, we, we all do better when we link arms with people. So any opportunity to link arms, I'm more than happy to explore. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for being available like that. And I'll be sure to put your contact information in the show notes. And I will just say you have been always one of the most approachable people I've known and uh, very open and giving. So um, you provide a a lot of value. (laughs) (laughs) So Alicia, thank you so much for your time today. And I hope we can do this again one day soon. Wonderful. Thanks, Mike. All right. So that is it for today's show. And I just want to, again, reiterate, think about this show, listen to it again. There was so much good stuff in here. And think about one or two big ideas or takeaways from the show and take some kind of action, big or small, and work on expanding your own boundaries. Thanks for joining us today. And I hope to see you on the next episode. This is the podcastfactory.com.